Thank you. Uh, so, a slide. There we go. So, uh, hi, I'm James Harrison. I've been working in and leading teams, designing, specifying, building, testing, and operating fibre to the home networks in the UK for just under 10 years. Um, I've spent a lot of those times, uh, years working for rural operator GigaClear in various roles, but lastly as chief engineer, uh, and currently work for Zoom, not the telephone conferencing company, the other one. Uh, so at time of writing, I've done about, I've helped connect about a quarter of a million homes across the UK. So I'm going to talk through a few things today, uh, hopefully interesting, a bit of history and some background on what the UK telecoms market looks like today, how fibres of the home access technologies actually work, um, the architecture of the last mile networks being built today, and how access networks are connected up to the internet. I am going to talk just UK specifics, but a lot of the technology is obviously used across the world, uh, and I'm not going to talk about coaxial networks because they're mostly becoming fibre now anyway. So put another way, we're going to talk about how we get cap videos to your house, specifically the last mile bits between an exchange, the head end, and your home. I hope we'll try and demystify somewhat the, the magic arrow on this diagram. So really, really, a very, 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 very quick run through of telecoms history, which is really fascinating, and I really wish that someone would do a talk on this for next EMF. Um, why copper? Uh, back in the very early days, we invented the telegraph and then the telephone came along and made that accessible. Uh, we deployed about 4,000 two-wire telegraph lines, but telephones we deployed much more rapidly. And by 1948, we had about 4.5 million lines across the country, mostly built by the GPO after it was nationalised. In 1981, the government privatised all telecoms networks and well, well, all of the government-owned ones, I should say, and formed British telecoms. And it was around that time that fibre was starting to get interesting as technology advanced. However, the government wanted this to be a competitive market, being the first privatised piece of telecoms uh, in the UK, and actually asked BT not to switch over to fibre. Um, and that's just because BT were the only people who at the time could do it, and they thought that was anti-competitive. Um, so we had a sort of missed opportunity there where we almost got fibre across the UK, but instead we ended up with copper. So now there's a lot in the ground that's going on for 50 or more years old, and it's not in the best shape. That gets increasingly expensive to operate and repair. Back in the mid-2010s, a few independents sprung up and started to have a go at building new networks. City Fiber, Hyperoptic, GigaClear, Community Fiber, and others managed to make the investment case work. And alternative network operators, Altnets, now cover well over 13 million homes. Sorry. That sort of volume woke BT up and got them moving. So we now have a uh, operator who are only building fiber across most of the country, and they're now aiming to get that turned off by roughly 2030, although the date keeps moving. So the last sort of interesting thing that happened in the UK market is something called PIA. In 2011, OpenReach was forced to open up by the regulator its duct network, because the regulator wants to see a bit more competition. That rental product was kind of unusable at the time for various reasons. It was a very restrictive licensing arrangement and for various boring reasons it couldn't be used. But in 2019 those got fixed under pressure from the regulator and suddenly networks became much, much cheaper to build. And at the start of 2019 there were about 25 significant alt nets all over the UK. By the end of 2021 there were well over 100 and it just went incredibly quickly. Um, a low cost of capital helped at the time as well, and we had a huge boom in alt nets. Many of those networks are now being built to sell, uh, with the expectation that there'll be consolidation again soon, um, but that's where we're at at the moment. Before I go into the physical layer stuff, I'm going to just address the fact that I'm not going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff, namely all of the sort of stuff that goes above the physical layer. All of that is really complicated, and this talk's already long enough and complicated enough. Uh, the goal of the access network, and what we're really digging into today, is about how we get Ethernet frames from your home to your ISP's Internet Edge. That is the access network's job. It's to get from your house to your ISP. Really, you can think of them, and the sort of simple way of thinking about them in terms of how they interact with all the other routers and so on, is that they're just really long Ethernet cables that are really complicated. And we just move Ethernet frames from your house to the ISP. So we're going to focus on these bits first, and then we'll work our way back up to the Internet. So fibre optics, how does this stuff actually work, and what does it look like? 
Optical fibers are effectively just cleverly engineered glass fibers. They start life out as a tube, and that tube gets dopants deposited on the inside face while it turns in a rotary furnace. And that tube gets collapsed down to form a preform, a solid glass rod that then gets drawn out like honey. And that gets melted down and drawn out into a glass fiber of 125 microns in diameter. But that doped surface in the middle collapses down to form a region about 9 microns across in the middle, which is what we call the core. And the clever bit is that that dopant forms an, a region that has a higher refractive index than the rest of the glass. And that means that light will bounce around it through total internal reflection. Light insert inside that will not escape, more or less. So as a visual representation of what that looks like, not to scale, because the core is very, very small and doesn't go on a diagram very well, um, you've got the core in the middle, you've got the cladding around that, which is just the rest of the glass, and then we have around that, to protect all of that delicate glass, a 250 micron coating that we put on, which is just plastic that's UV cured and the fibers being made. So the whole fiber itself is about 250 microns wide uh, as we use it in the industry. So to make networks, we have to be able to join bits of these fibers together. And there's two ways to do this. There's mechanical splicing and arc splicing. Uh, mechanical splicing isn't used very commonly. Uh, the German market, for some reason, has a huge take up of mechanical splicing, but that is literally the only place on Earth I'm aware of it. Um, in the rest of the world, we use arc fusion splicing. And arc fusion splicing effectively involves a machine like this, uh, which has two XY positioning stages and a microscope and the microscope can see the core, lines the two ends of the fibers up, and then uses the arc to melt that glass and squish them together. And there's a little microcontroller which controls this process. And this is how we make fiber joints uh, today. We also typically have a heater in those that puts a bit of heat shrink around the fiber joint to the splice to protect it. Fiber is really quite weak and vulnerable, so we have to protect it inside cables most of the time. So we've got armor and so on to protect them. When we have to work with fibers individually and make those joints, we've got to strip all of that away. But we need to get at least a few meters of that cable fiber out to be able to splice in. So we have to remove those and put them into a, another protection, and we call those fiber joints nor closures. So splice closures come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, I've got two pictures here. One is the, the sort of one at the front is the uh, smallest sort of closures you can get, which literally are housing a single fiber. This is actually my internet connection at home. Um, and that has a single fiber and that's it. It's also got space for a connector in this case. These go up to thousands of fibers in a single joint. The one on the right there is a pretty typical one that can take 288 fiber splices. So we can bring cables into these joints get the fiber out of them and then protect it inside that environment because these then go into slightly more hostile environments. In the UK we typically have closures that range between 24 and 288 fibers. Inside those closures we've got these splice trays and those splice trays are where we lay all of these splices up and we protect them and as well as their associated loops of fiber. So all of these are multicolored fibers, we'll come to that in a sec. And they're in their 250 micron coating, which has got a color added to them, so we can tell them apart. The tubes in the middle there are splice protectors. The loops of fiber around or above the splices in these trays are, because we've just got to be able to get enough to work out, uh, enough, uh, sorry, enough slack to get out onto a workbench. But also, if we need to break any of these and remake them to change the routing of the network or to repair a cable, we need enough slack because every time we do a splice, we take a bit of fiber off the end to do so. We use colors to identify elements in groups of 12. This is used for both individual fibers and for uh, any other elements of the cable. We try and stick to groups of 12 throughout so we can use the same color scheme. There is definitely only one standard for this and um, not 50, and it's called TIA 598, and it's this. Uh, if anyone else says that they've got a different fiber color code, they haven't, they're wrong. Um, splicing is hard, making connectors is actually even harder. Uh, making a fiber connector usually involves gluing the fiber into the middle of a ferrule made of zirconia and then cleaving it and polishing it to a perfect finish of a very specific geometry. This is really best done in a factory. So normally we get connectors factory made and we get a, a thing called a pigtail which is a, a piece of fiber with a connector on one end and a end ready to splice on the other. And that's what we use in the field. 
Connectors have got more loss than splices and need to be kept clean, so we try not to use them anywhere really. But in some places we need the flexibility, so those typically are the end of the network where we need to be able to make connections and break them easily. And sometimes networks incorporate them in the middle for flexibility. So here's a couple of examples of connectors that we typically use on the fiber networks, particularly for access networks. Uh, the big boxy ones are called SC connectors, and that's the most common one you'll find. The other one that we use a lot of are LC connectors, which are the ones up at the top right of this uh, picture. Just below that you can see a microscope image of a fiber end face, and if you squint really, really hard and look in the very, very middle of that, you can see a slightly darker region of the image, and that's the actual fiber. And then the core is just nine microns across in the middle of that. So we're talking much, much, much smaller than the human hair. All of the fiber connectors have got a spring in them, which pushes the two ends of the fiber together as firmly as possible, because we want to make a really, really good glass-to-glass -glass contact. We don't want any air or any oil or water or anything in there. We want glass-to-glass -glass so we don't get any reflections. Managing reflections is actually a big part of access network connector design as well. So these are the two main types of connector ends we have, and the different colors, green and blue, represent them. Uh, so PC or UPC, ultra-polished contact, is the blue uh, one, and these are polished as flat as possible, effectively. Um, on APC connectors, we actually polish everything at an eight degree angle, and that means that any light that's coming from the end of the fiber back bounces at an eight degree angle and goes straight into the cladding. It doesn't bounce all the way back down the fiber. It breaks past the total internal reflection effectively. It's really important on access networks because we leave a lot of connectors unconnected when we build them and all of those uh, connectors then reflect a little bit of light through Fresnel reflections. We also have a lot of dirt in access networks, a lot of mud, a lot of people not cleaning things properly um, and this also creates reflections and eventually those reflections add up and cause problems. Fiber connectors have to be really, really clean. Uh, the image on the left here is a micro, uh, microscope image of the fiber after I just wiped it on a clean fingertip. Um, it's really important to keep these things clean because you can see there's a fiber of some sort that's falling right across the core region. This will transmit very little light. So what we want is on the right-hand side, nice clean surfaces, and we use mostly isopropyl alcohol and lint-free cloths to make that happen. The geometry of fiber connectors is also another reason why we keep things really clean. I mentioned we want glass-to-glass -glass contact. We want that to be really, really tight and secure. So we have quite a lot of mating force and we have very small surfaces because we polish the ends to a sort of dome-like um, uh, geometry. And that means that the actual mating region is only about 200 microns wide. So we have quite a lot of force, a very small region. So if there's any dirt or anything left in there, typically what happens is the dirt just simply explodes when it's mated together because there's about 17 to 20,000 pounds per square inch of pressure in that region. And that can actually damage the fiber, it can damage the connector, even though it's all made of glass, there's just so much force going on there. So we don't want to permanently damage things, so cleanliness is really important. So individual fibers can be just given a bit of extra protection and put in a cable, but we tend to make things easier for ourselves by grouping them up into bunches of 12. Uh, and these are called buffer tubes because we wrap them in buffering material. Um, we, for most of these cables, use exactly the same color coding scheme, so this makes it much easier to handle these cables because if we have, for example, 144 fibers, we don't want to be trying to mark each of those fibers separately uh, with a color code or with dots and stripes and things like that because these things are 250 microns wide. It gets really boring trying to look at those and go, eh. um, So instead we have, you know, fiber 13 is the blue fiber in the orange tube. We, we can very easily go through and, and uh, determine which fiber we're on uh, that way. We use a gel to protect the fibers just to make sure that any water that's absorbed doesn't freeze and damage things. And then finally, we need to put all these in cables. So we take those buffer tubes and we either put them in a tube in the cable or we put them around a central strength member. And we have a strength member in there to make sure that the cables don't bend too much, that we don't end up with these things being crushed or damaged during pulling operations. Typically that's fiberglass, but we also use steel wire or steel tape. Uh, and then we are ready to go. We've got a cable. 
So this is the sort of cable design that we have in most of the UK networks. Uh, this is for blown fibre. We have a, a strength member down the middle made of fibreglass, and then we have all of the fibres themselves wrapped in these buffer tubes going around that core. You'll also see a lot of these in the UK networks. These are slightly different cables for lower fibre counts. Uh, these go up to about 48, although there's some other people doing more dense cable designs with this sort of construction. Uh, and these are designed for overhead use predominantly, but they are also used underground. Uh, and these use steel wire for the strength members. There are a lot of different cable designs out there. Um, there's also a thing called ribbons that we don't uh, use in fiber access networks that much, but are starting to get into uh, more routine use, which we won't talk about now, because uh, I've only got 40 minutes. Um, but the cables that you'll see sort of in the middle here are very commonly found in UK networks. Um, so we've now understand, hopefully, what our fiber looks like and what the medium looks like we're dealing with here. The trouble is we need to have less of it because if every home needs a fiber, we're in trouble. So Ethernet, we know and love as a signaling protocol, but it's not terribly smart for building access networks. It's point to point, so we can only talk from one computer to another on a single Ethernet link. That means we would need a dedicated fiber for every single home in the country. That's a problem. Um, we can use different colors of light, so we only need one fiber, so we use wavelength division multiplexing to send downstream traffic one way and upstream traffic the other way in effectively different colors uh, and filter it out at the other end. So we only need one fiber, not two, but it's still not going to scale very well. At small scale, it's very good, and quite a few small, really small networks do use Ethernet, um, just because it means that you can use completely off-the-shelf bits otherwise. But if we're going to build this at scale for a whole nationwide network rollout, we really do need something to be much cheaper. A lot of what we're going to be talking about in the rest of this talk is ultimately really, really fiddly and technically complicated cost engineering. Uh, we need to eliminate as many splices as we can, we need to get rid of many transceivers as we can, and get rid of as many joints as we can. Because anything we have to do once per home, we now have to do 25 million times and probably more. So passive optical networking is the key tech we need to make this work. So we effectively use, in passive optical networks, a device called a splitter. And the splitter divides the light up from our head end, our central location, to many homes. And the light coming back from the homes then gets recombined going the other way and ends up as a single set of light going towards the, the central end. At this point, though, Ethernet no longer works because that's a point-to-point -point networking technology. So we need to have something else to let us do all of this and to communicate over this network. And PON is used both to describe the family of, physical, of signaling protocols and the physical network built to use it. This is a splitter. In the field, they don't resemble this at all. They're just encapsulated at a factory. So what you actually get in the field is a little silver box about the size of a little finger with some fibers coming out of one end and a fiber in one end. And they are physical waveguides. They work a lot like radio splitters work um, and are effectively etched paths that we feed light into. And through magic, we come out with a perfectly balanced set of outputs. Um, that's uh, all made in the factory, and we just put those into the closures where we need them. We can split fairly well. We can get up to about 64 homes practically off of a single fiber before we run out of light, because every time we split that fiber, we lose a little bit of light on the path going to each home. So 1 to 64, uh, we lose about 17 decibels of light. We need to stay below about 31 decibels of loss from end to end. Every splice, connector, and splitter adds loss, and just traveling down fiber loses you some light. 164 typically will get us about seven kilometers. One to 128 gets you about three kilometers, and 132 gets you about 13 kilometers. So it, normally most operators will stick to 1 to 64 because that gets you enough people uh, within range of your transceivers. But sometimes there's a mixture, and you'll have some networks using a combination of that and 1 to 32. You're also sharing this in bandwidth terms, of course, and anything going over about 1 to 64 starts to get really tight on bandwidth as well. So it's a telecoms talk, which means we've got to have some acronyms. So OLTs, optical line terminals, these are the boxes that sit in the exchanges, street cabinets. They are the head end of the network. ONTs, also ONUs, but everyone typically calls them ONTs, are optical network terminals, and those are the boxes that sit in your home. 
Everything in between that is called the ODN, but most people just call them ponds because pond doesn't get reused enough. So how do we go about doing this? We're going to have to use wavelength division multiplexing. We're also going to need to use time division multiplexing, and we're also going to need some encryption to make all this work. There's various versions of PON. Gigabit PON or GPON is what BT in the UK have mostly deployed and are starting to move on to XGS PON, which is the next generation that's being widely adopted. Um, that gets you 10 gigabits of uh, bandwidth in each direction. Not quite uh, Ethernet bandwidth, but we'll come back to that. Most altnets are deploying XGS PON because they're new networks, and there are some new ones in the future coming along. There's already NG PON 2, which has been around for a while, and 25 and 50 gig PON. 50 gig PON is probably going to be the next one, but it's still too expensive for anyone to be deploying it at scale. So let's start with the easy one, wavelength division multiplexing. We're using different wavelengths of light, infrared, so we're just talking different infrared wavelengths to and from the home. Making lasers which transmit at roughly one wavelength or another is pretty easy and cheap, but only when we've got a really big gap to the next thing. Getting things really precise is expensive. So red and yellow, easy enough. If you were trying to make lasers emitting it effectively, scarlet, crimson, carmine, that's now expensive and we can't do this at the sort of scale we need. Receivers are essentially colorblind, so we can just put a filter in front of those and we just put a bandpass filter for the, whatever we need uh, and that's it, we're done. Giving each home its own color doesn't really work. We'd have to give everything very, very narrow and precise wavelengths because we haven't got that many to play with. And that's just too expensive for the, the network we're building. So we can use this to separate our upstream and our downstream traffic really easily. So downstream traffic's also pretty straightforward. We've got an OLT and it's just going to send out on a single continuous laser transmission everybody's traffic. And everyone's getting traffic's coming down the same wavelength and that's it, we're done. Uh, the amount of time that we spend talking about each person's traffic, each subscriber's traffic, varies depending on how much bandwidth they need, what configuration there is in this system for how, what package they're on, how much bandwidth they should have, all of these sorts of things, and is dy dynamically altered very quickly and repeatedly. We also need to keep this secure, so we effectively use TLS. There is a Diffie-Hellman key exchange between the ONT and the OLT, and the OLT just encrypts all of the traffic for every subscriber with the ONT's key. So only the ONT can decrypt it, and it's fine. Everything's great. Um, this is optically really easy because it's a continuous transmission. Upstream is much harder because we can't do that. Lasers like to be on all of the time and to modulate a little bit up and down, and that's what most laser signaling does, if we're talking about the sort of fiber optics you'll find running around camp. Everything's on all the time and then just varying in brightness. If we do that with lots of lasers, all pointing the same direction through a splitter, then when a laser is effectively saying nothing, it's still emitting a lot of light, and that just will swamp the receiver at the other end and we'll just not hear anything. So we actually need to turn all of these lasers off completely off or very, very dim at the end of their transmission cycles. This is just very hard to do from an engineering standpoint. And this is why upstream speeds have taken longer to come along than downstream speeds. Uh, GPON isn't actually two and a, uh, one gig, it's two and a half gig down. And for a very long time, it was one gig up. It's now two and a half gig up as well on newer technology. But the upstream lasers were so hard to get right that it just took such a long time. It, yeah, XGS PON has only just gotten cheap enough now in this domain. So this is how this kind of looks on the wire in the upstream direction. And you can see each ONT here with a different burst of traffic. These bursts are really small. These are typically 400 nanoseconds wide. Um, and this is happening all the time. The amount of time those bursts last for varies in time. Again, depending on how much bandwidth is required and so on. And that's all managed by the OLT uh, over in the communications channel and is adapted very rapidly. The different brightnesses here you can tell are from, uh, you can see are different loss levels. So we're just receiving less light from an ONT, one ONT or another. And that might be because they're further away and, or there's a bad splice on one of them or other reasons. On top of all of this, we have a new layer which fits us all, lets us fit all of the ethernet traffic into this domain without going through huge amounts of reframing, uh, which is called the transmission convergence layer. And this doesn't just handle Ethernet, it also carries things like management signals between the ONT and the OLT, and you can also put TDM and other weird stuff we don't use anymore in there. But effectively, that layer encapsulates everything and gives us a common framing layer. 
At each end, we still talk Ethernet. One of the other cool things about PONS is that we can use different systems at the same time because we use different wavelengths. So we can use old and new tech on the same fibers without having to change anything, without having to swap anyone's kit out at home, or without having to change anything at the head ends either. We use a, effectively a coexistence module, which is a, essentially a, a splitter wired in backwards. So instead of splitting out towards homes, we split towards different pieces of equipment in the exchange. And that means that if we decide to roll out 50 gig PON at some point in the future, we can do that fibre by fibre at the exchange piecemeal, and BT are already doing this to move from GPON to XGS PON. They can uplift individual fibres where there's enough demand and send out new kits of subscribers on that line so they don't overwhelm the existing ones, or for business services. You can see here the wavelengths, this is just a sort of a very uh, a course summary of where all of the different wavelengths sit in this band. Uh, upstream tends to be in the higher loss bands because it's much more important that we can talk to the ONT than the ONT can talk to us because we can tell misbehaving ONTs to turn themselves off. Um, but uh, everything in the downstream direction tends to sit in the SNL bands where we have a little less loss. So we've now got a multi-party system and we can share some fiber. Two wavelengths, 64 ONTs, and just one fibre at the OLT for all of those 64 homes. In practice, that means we're now going from maybe 5,000 ports down to maybe 80 or 100 for a town like Ledbury. So if your access equipment per port cost is maybe 50 pounds, which is pretty typical, um, you've just saved a quarter of a million pounds just on Ledbury. And that's just for the access equipment cost. We've now also saved on the amount of space we need, the power we need to run all of those ports. Every single splice will cost us some money, so we've just saved a bunch of money on all of that, and so on and so on. It adds up very quickly if we have to add more fibers in, and that's why PON's such a big deal. This makes fiber usable for national rollouts. So, we've now got our cables down to some sensible sizes. We now need to physically get this stuff around our town or rural area. Uh, for rural versions, just imagine it's all far, further apart. It's all the same stuff. So access networks end somewhere. So where is that? It depends on the network we're going to. For most people, it'll be a BT exchange if you're on BT fiber. Uh, for altnets, that tends to be street cabinets because we don't like having buildings typically. Um, BT are also consolidating their exchange footprint, so there's fewer exchanges needed for fiber, and a lot of exchanges are going to go away and be sold. The fiber goes back to fewer central exchanges. Uh, City fiber have also got that sort of model. But effectively, we've got to get to where our first point of electrical ag aggregation is happening, where we're going to hand off to a piece of actual network equipment. Aggregation networks, and there's lots of different names for them, metro and these sorts of things, ag networks effectively link together all of these sites and get a lot of, collect uh, of traffic collected together. The reason for this is that the backhaul section, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, that is an area where it's really expensive to move lots of uh, any data around and to get those links established. Um, those areas are where we want to have lots of traffic grouped up to make that cost effective. This also is how we get some more resilience in the network as well. So here's a typical alt-net cabinet um, and the chamber with the fiber closures and ducting and cabling all ready to go next to it. So you can see in the chamber there, there's some orange ducts coming in, and we've got some two main closures there, which are these big black things, and there's also some co cable coiled up there that hasn't yet been spliced in, but is waiting, ready to go. So inside that cabinet, we've got some aggregation hardware at the top. That's where the, that's a router effectively, it's gonna take us across to the next cabinet or to the next piece of long haul equipment. Below that, we've got some patch panels for that aggregation equipment. And then below that, we've got our access equipment, our OLTs. Below that, we've then got our patch panels going off to our individual ponds. Essentially, each of those connectors has got about 64 homes on the other end. Here's another example of a cabinet. The OLT here is on the right, and that connects across to the panels on the left, which have connectors in. This one's got some extra kit below the OLT for fiber optic test and monitoring. And on the top left, you've got some more routers and other backhaul equipment. So now we know where we need to get to, let's jump back to home. Fiber in the home is pretty boring. You get a box on the wall, and instead of it being like the old BT copper master sockets, it becomes a box on the wall that needs some power. 
because uh, we don't get our power from the exchange over fiber, that needs much bigger fibers. Uh, the typical thing we do here is not to splice anything at the home. Everything tends to be pre-connectorized because splices are expensive and we don't have lots of them. Uh, there's also options here if we need to get out of a block of flats, for example. We have low profile fibers for getting around them. When we're leaving the house, we need to get into our operator's network. So the question first is, are we going overhead or underground? Overhead's much cheaper to build, but not many operators are building new overhead these days because communities do not like having new poles up, and it's an easy way to annoy your customer base. Underground's the other way to go, and where ducts already exist, this is almost always the preference. If there aren't already ducts, then it becomes quite expensive, but some outlets do still do their own digging. There are cases where we really do have to use overhead, and that's typically avoiding things like railways or rivers. Sure, uh, small rivers, I should say. So, underground first. What have historically been left by the government post office and what BT have been built since is all broadly what started out as two and four inch ducts and are now 96 and 54 mil ducts. And these can fit lots of ropes and cables through. We typically use cable pulling uh, through to install anything into those ducts. We also use micro ducts, and micro ducts are designed specifically for putting a single cable into. They're smaller, they're typically anywhere between 2 to uh, 25 to 5 mil diameter, uh, and they can be used for blown fiber, which we'll get to in a second. So this is what a typical BT duct looks like in an open trench. Quite often there are multiples of these ducts laid next to each other for capacity, uh, but you have to open a big trench up to put them in. So if we have to do any digging for big ducts like that, open trenching is the only way to go. For micro ducts, we can use micro trenching and mole plowing, which are effectively mechanized ways of going about this. Um, they do a bit re require a bit more upfront planning because if you're driving what's effectively a meter wide carbide cutter through the ground, you want to be really careful about hitting gas mains and things. Um, and we still use mole plowing in soft areas where we can effectively plow the fiber in. And here's some examples of some nice, neat micro trenching being done. One of the bigger challenges with this is actually reinstatement, because it's really hard to compact anything back down if you want to fill these holes back up. So we tend to have to use exotic weird things like foamed concrete. And here's some examples of micro ducts. They tend to get bundled up like the one on the right for installation, because dealing with individual tubes can get quite unwieldy. But there are situations where we keep them loose and separate. You can see again here the color scheme being used um, to identify duct one, two, three, four, etc. And here's some of those being laid into a trench, um, just so you can see that. So blown fiber is an interesting thing. Most of the cables that are being installed today are done with blown fiber. And blown fiber is a bit of a misnomer. It's actually pushed fiber, but using air assistance and effectively Microducts are small, but are really easy for us to join together. We don't have a, a lot of cost to join microducts, unlike with fiber. So we can do all of the bits where we go and dig all of the roads up and put all of the fiber and all of the duct in the ground, rather, a bit at a time, somewhat piecemeal, and jointing them, breaking them, jointing them, breaking them. That's all really cheap and low cost for us, and it's very quick. Because effectively, it's just push fit plumbing connections. And we do have proper fiber optic uh, connectors here, but there's lots of plumbing ones in the ground as well. This means that you can effectively do all your stop-start construction with that and it becomes really straightforward. You don't have to put new fibre joints in every time you have to stop uh, for you know, traffic management reasons and these sorts of things. Once we've done all of that hard building work, we blow the fibres through and we do that by effectively pushing a cable along with some rollers and at the same time flowing a huge amount of air through, typically uh, sort of seven to eight bar of pressure is what we try and achieve at the pushing end. And that creates a, a layer of air moving past the cable that lubricates it as it go through, goes through the micro duct. If you're just pushing fibers down a micro duct, you might get 100 meters or so. With blowing fiber, you can get two, three kilometers pretty readily. Chambers are where all of our duct and fiber networks are joined and rooted and give us kind of a reenterable space to get into to make adjustments. And there's, as with closures, a lot of different sizes there. For, from really, really small ones all the way up to the manholes you can climb into. These days they're usually made out of thermoplastic, but quite a lot of brick ones are still out there. Uh, and you can see here on the left here, we've got a, a micro a chamber that's a fairly typical old BT one. Uh, so brick built, BT ducts in the bottom there. And on the right hand side, a much muddier one out in the field uh, with some micro ducts and a, a joint in there. There's no ceiling in here, so everything that goes into a chamber has to be happy being underwater. 
um, which is why we have those closures and protect everything so well. Overhead's a little easier. All we have to do is put an eyelet on the home, pull a sash line across, which is effectively a light line that we can then use to get the uh, attention to the route established, and then we'll pull the cable up thereafter using that line. We then use a clamp at each end to secure it in place. Job done. Really easy. There's variations on this theme for things like hollow poles and things, but fundamentally it's all variations on the theme. So where are we getting to first? Drop terminals are where we have our first connectorized point on the network that we need to get to. Here's a few examples of hardened drop terminals. These are the most common ones you'll find out in the UK. Uh, these have got a proprietary connector on them, which is Corning's OptiTap, uh, typically. And these have got connectors on that are sealed when mated or when they're uh, not connected. So these can go in chambers, they can go on poles. Drop cabinets are also used, and these are where typically if you've got a lot of micro ducts, like here at the bottom, you can see all these micro ducts coming in from different homes. Those get, that's where all the fibre gets blown to and then connected in. You can see an engineer here cleaning a fibre, which is a rare occurrence, but it does happen. <laughs> this is a drop terminal using standard connectors. Uh, quite a lot of terminals have got some capacity for splicing as well, which gives us a bit more flexibility. And you can actually see a splitter in this one uh, on the right hand side, a very tiny little silver rectangle. At poles you'll find both types. Um, the gotcha of any types that need splicing is that they'll typically have a big coil of cable on the back, um, and you can see that here, and that lets the joint be removed down to ground level if we need to do any repairs or maintenance on it. One last thing to talk to when it comes about when it comes to splitters is that we can connect them to each other and daisy chain them. So if we put a one to eight off the back of another one to eight, we end up with one to sixty-four, which is fine. Uh, we can't go too far on that, of course, because we'll run out of light. But it does let us do distributed splitting, which means that we can effectively put smaller splitters closer to groups of properties, and that lets us be more efficient with how we use those splitter outputs. Effectively, we only have 64 splitter outputs worth of light on our fiber. We want to make the best use of them. In towns, we typically will end up with uh, fewer centralized splitters, and we, only, uh, we don't want to end up with connecting only a few homes because we've run out of splitter ports. This is a terrible diagram showing you a couple of examples of that. So on a 1 to 64, you can see we have more fibers coming back from the drop terminals. On the distributed model, we don't need as many fibers to come back from our drop terminals. Um, but we do end up with more splices, more joints, and more splitters. So it's a little more complicated. If we can avoid it, we do. So the, it's just, this in, our journey is a little complicated from here. It's hard to say where we're going to go because there are so many different variations of how it's best to place your splitters, how it's best to wire this all up. There are lots of good answers, and all of the UK networks look slightly different. Nobody's settled on one. Most of the time, though, these are a standard-ish model, and they are then adapted by computer optimization to maximize the amount of properties connected for the lowest cost, and that's where the networks that get built and designed. Once we're at our aggregation point, we normally end up at a connector on a patch panel or distribution frame, which is just a really big patch panel. And from there, we get patched across to our OLT, and we are effectively done. That is our complete journey on the access network. So we're at the aggregation point. We've got one last hop to go now. Am I good for a couple of minutes? OK. Um, so we'll run through these quickly, because I've run out of time. Um, Getting on to aggregation, backhaul, and your ISP. The internet in the UK is here. It's in London. That's where you need to get to. Sorry, Manchester, you're not big enough to be part of this. Um, it's also in Slough. Um, <laughs> so please don't at me if I've missed your favorite DC. It's in these two locations where most of the UK internet is. That's where you've got to get to. Most network operators have got really big, established, well, uh, well established long haul networks. Those are all over the place with lots of fiber going very long distance. Um, we've got to get all of our traffic onto that tr network and we've got to get that around as effectively as possible, efficiently as possible. To go long distance, we've got to amplify fiber uh, light so that we can go far enough without losing the light so it's so dim we can't receive it. So we've got two ways of doing amplification um, that are both used on long haul networks. Both of those are really expensive and we don't like doing it, 
So we tend to pack everyone in as densely as we can. One minute. Um, and we'll pack everyone in using WDM, the more expensive form I mentioned earlier, to get as many subscribers as traffic as possible onto fiber. We can put about 15 terabits per second onto a single fiber and then amplify that single fiber rather than having to deal with lots of different connections. Most small operators have lit services delivered to them instead of dealing with all of this directly. Uh, and most of the time, if you're dealing with a small old net, this is what you're getting. Uh, and that's effectively subletting a bit of that DWDM network. Eventually, we get to the ISP's internet edge, and that's it. We've made it to the internet. So, our journey is done. Dozens of technologies at every step, and eventually you can get cat videos from the internet to your phone. <laughs>